on the face of it, Benfica are a club that are doing just fine. They have won three out of three games at the start of the Portuguese Primeira Liga season, at least at the time of recording. They have brought in the free-scoring Ukrainian centre-forward Roman Yeremchuk for a bargain £15 million, who has already made a bright start to life in Lisbon, and they even overcame both the Russian Premier League and the Eredivisie runners-up in Spartak Moscow and PSV over the last few weeks in order to qualify for the group stage of this season's UEFA Champions League, presenting a major boost to the club from both a footballing and financial perspective. However, if you scratch just a little beneath the surface, though it may not yet fully reveal itself out on the pitch, sporting Lisbao Benfica are a club in crisis. Last season, Benfica finished third in the Primera Liga, which is basically a calamity in of itself for the most successful football club in a country which is almost entirely dominated by just three teams. That was the club's lowest league finish in more than a decade, and they have now gone two whole seasons without winning a major trophy, having won 10 in the space of just six seasons prior to this recent slump. Clearly, that represents a steep and severe drop-off for the club, and there are reasons for that downturn that we will discuss. But failing to win a trophy for a couple of years and finishing third, whilst considered disastrous by Benfica's high standards, is not the crisis at Benfica that I am referring to, which is one that is altogether far more damning, dramatic, and potentially consequential, not just for Portugal's most successful club, but is capable of sending shockwaves throughout all of European football. In July 2021, Benfica's longtime club president, Luís Felipe Vieira, was arrested by Portuguese authorities as part of their Operation Cartel Vermeo, or Operation Red Card, as it translates in English. Vieira wasn't the only one arrested alongside him, was his son Tiago, the businessman and major Benfica shareholder, José Antonio dos Santos, and the football agent, Bruno Mercedes. Meanwhile, Benfica's offices were raided as part of the investigation. It was neither the first time that Benfica's offices had been raided, nor was it the first time Vieira had been in trouble with the law. Back in 1993, he was sentenced to 20 months in prison for stealing a truck in 1984, though he never actually served his sentence owing to two amnesty laws which saw him granted a full pardon. What he is accused of now, the implications of his alleged crimes, and the potential consequences for both Benfica, those involved, and of the wider footballing community are the topic of today's video, as we delve into a deep malaise and scandal which is troubling one of only eight teams to have ever successfully defended a European Cup or Champions League crown. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to the capital of Portugal one of Europe and indeed the world's great footballing talent factories and overachievers at both club and international level. To the second oldest capital city in Europe, which was granted municipium status by Julius Caesar in 13 BC and granted the status of Champions of Europe twice during the 1960s by an even greater historical figure, Eusebio, but is now fighting to prevent its empire from crumbling like Rome did with some surprising similarities between the two. Normally, I begin these what on earth is going on videos with a quick background on the club themselves, their founding, perhaps some quirky tales, their successes and failures, and a little synopsis on the history of the club. But in the case of a club that is the size of Benfica, I'm not sure that's necessary. Benfica are the best supported and most successful club in Portuguese football. 37-time Portuguese champions, Benfica have won 84 trophies in total, making them one of the most successful football clubs in the world. The most treasured among those 84 trophies are two European Cups, which Benfica won back-to-back -back in 1961 and 1962, as they brought Real Madrid's stronghold over European football to an end, inspired by the brilliance of two Mozambique-born Portuguese internationals in midfield and attack, namely Mario Coluna and Eusebio. Long viewed as the club of Portugal's working class, Benfica enjoyed tremendous support both in terms of pure numbers and their passion for the club. Prior to the pandemic, Benfica averaged roughly 53,000 fans at their home games, which was among the highest average in Europe. Some polls suggest that as many as 47% of Portuguese football fans support Benfica, and Bayern Munich are the only club in world football with more fully paid up members than Benfica. 
The club had more than 230,000 fans paying to be members at the last count, which is more than the likes of FC Barcelona, Manchester United, and their great rivals in Lisbon, Sporting Club de Portugal. 11 years is the longest Benfica have ever gone without winning a top flight league title during Porto's era of dominance from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. But the Eagles reasserted their dominance during the 2010s, almost winning a hallowed five successive league titles between 2013 and 2018, but ultimately just falling at the final hurdle. Benfica have never won five league titles in a row, and their failure to do so yet again when supporters felt that they had such a glaring opportunity but failed to make the investment decisions required to stave off the competition has been a source of some bitterness in Lisbon. You see, when it comes to youth development, scouting, and the acquisition of young players, few clubs do it better than Benfica. Whether it be homegrown talents like Bernardo Silva, Joao Cancelo, and Renato Sanchez, or players that Benfica signed young before shifting them on for enormous profits like Angel Di Maria, Nemanja Matic, or Raul Jimenez, Benfica just seem to get it right when it comes to young players time and time again. In the last two or three years alone, Benfica have sold Mexican centre-forward Raul Jimenez for £34 million to Wolves, powerful centre-back Ruben Diaz to Manchester City for over £61 million, plus Nicolas Otamendi, and most notably of all, young starlet Joao Felix, who joined Atletico Madrid for £113 million, making him the fourth most expensive player in the history of the sport. Over the last decade, Benfica have raised more than €1 billion euros through player sales, which is the most of any club in world football. So at first glance, Benfica appeared to be one of the best-run clubs in the world. But with all of that money raised through player sales, continued incredible support, few great outlays in the transfer market on the club's part, and a modest wage budget, at least by Champions League standards, that has led some to the question, where's the money? Whilst Benfica have raised enough cash to buy 40 Challenger 2 tanks, though that would seem like rather an unusual investment for a football club, their own club record signing costs just £21 million, and they have only spent over £20 million on a player once. And yet, the club somehow still has nearly €150 million Euros of debt, almost €120 million Euros net debt, and some rather unusual miscellaneous items that seem to crop up in every one of their accounts. The answer to the question, where's the money, many Benfica fans have long contested, is one that they believe ought to be addressed to their recently arrested club president, Luís Felipe Vieira. Vieira has long been suspected of wrongdoing by supporters and has long been investigated by the authorities. Benfica's club president since 2003, and also the president of the club's SAD board of directors, which is a distinction that I will explain in just a moment, Vieira was always a controversial president in many respects. Aside from his pardon sentence dating back to the 1980s and 90s before becoming Benfica's president, Vieira spent 10 years as the president of FC Alverca, one of a number of smaller clubs on the outskirts of Lisbon with whom he had won promotion to the Primera Liga. That is no big deal, Alverca, a much too small fry to ever be considered as rivals of Benfica's, and the fact that Vieira had experience in football, you might reasonably argue, was a good thing. That may well be true, but Alverca also developed a reputation for having particularly close ties with Porto during Vieira's time at the club, who are fellow members of Portugal's Ostre Grande, or Big Three, and are arguably Benfica's biggest rivals. I say arguably, I mean certainly. What's more, before quitting Alverca to join Benfica in 2001, initially as an advisor to the club's SAD, Vieira had been a paying member, a socio, of both Porto and Sporting Club de Portugal, Benfica's biggest local and sporting rivals, but not of Benfica themselves. Basically, he was a member of every one of the big three except for Benfica. Nonetheless, within just two years, in 2003, which was the peak of Benfica's slump and title drought, Vieira was elected as the club's 33rd president with more than 90% of the vote. A native of the São Domingos de Benfica district of Lisbon, which is also home to Benfica's Estadio de Luz, Vieira grew up in a working-class household. He first entered the world of business in the car tyre industry, working his way up from the bottom before starting his own partnership, 
which would come to dominate the market. Here, Vieira earned the nickname Gaddafi dos Pneus, meaning Gaddafi of Tires, referring to the Libyan revolutionary due to Vieira's infamously aggressive negotiating techniques, along with his ruthlessness when it came to dominating the market and not giving competitors a chance. This nickname stuck with Vieira long after he'd moved on from the tyre business, going on to amass a considerable fortune primarily through construction and real estate. Vieira's construction company would become one of the largest in Portugal, and by 2008 he had amassed a personal fortune estimated to be worth 162 million euros, making him the 74th wealthiest person in all of Portugal. Despite his controversial former allegiances, business practices, and later pardoned criminal sentencing, Vieira's reign as Benfica president got off to a strong start. Having arrived when the club was at its lowest ebb, Benfica ended their 11-year Primeira Liga title drought on Vieira's watch, and though it would take another five years for their next title to arrive, Benfica did become hugely successful in the mid to late 2010s, firstly under Jorge Jesus, and then under Rui Vitoria. Vieira was re-elected as Benfica president six times, enjoying landslide successes in his early years, but severely declining popularity in the club's most recent presidential election, held in 2020. Officially, Vieira won 62.59% of the votes, with more votes being cast than there have been in any previous presidential election at Benfica, partly because of an increase in electronic voting due to the pandemic. Controversially, the president of Benfica's General Assembly, Virgilio Duque Vieira, refused to count any physical votes, which were apparently poorly sealed in insecure ballot boxes, and taken away by the club's own security team, despite promising Vieira's rival candidates that he would count them. This led to the legitimacy of Vieira's re-election being called into question, both by Vieira's rivals, but also by a large section of the Benfica fanbase. In 2018, the Portuguese Attorney General's office confirmed that Vieira was a formal suspect in their investigations into influence peddling. Vieira was suspected of having offered a judge named Rui Rangel a position at Benfica ahead of Rangel overseeing a lawsuit related to a company belonging to a member of Vieira's family. This was the first time Vieira had been officially cited in an investigation into an abuse of his office. And I must stress that Vieira has not been convicted of anything yet, but Benfica fans had long suspected that this had been the case. When Vieira was arrested last month, along with a number of his associates, his potential charge sheet was a lengthy one. Vieira stands accused of orchestrating a tax fraud, a money laundering scheme since 2014, worth a total amount of 100 million euros, which investigators claim may have caused significant damage to the state and to some companies. The transfers that investigators really seem to have honed in on, presumably because that is where they feel they have the most compelling evidence, are those of Paraguayans Delis Gonzalez and Claudio Correa, along with Brazilian centre-back Cesar Martins. Vieira, along with businessman and agent Bruno Macedo, who was also arrested as part of Operation Red Card, are accused of embezzling 2.5 million euros from those three transfers. The primary crime that Vieira is accused of committing is basically of overpaying on the part of the club in terms of administrative costs, with a certain amount of money being paid by the club to funds owned by Macedo in the United States, which was subsequently transferred to funds in Tunisia and the United Arab Emirates before returning to Portugal, supposedly, in a complex web of deception designed to disguise the true identity of the Portuguese account holders and beneficiaries of those funds, which Portuguese authorities believe to be Luís Felipe and Tiago Vieira, hence why Vieira's son was also arrested. There are suspicions that transfer dealings might not be the only instances in which Vieira and his band of brothers skimmed a little, or a lot, off the top for themselves, but that they could have been doing so with virtually any financial transaction. As well as a breach of trust against Benfica, an abuse of his office, and defrauding the club, the financial operation Vieira is accused of being involved in also implicates him in crimes of tax evasion and money laundering, since the Portuguese taxman hasn't received a penny for his and his son's supposed gains made in Portugal. The month before his arrest, Vieira was also a target of a lawsuit brought upon him by one of Benfica's board members. George Matamoris accused Vieira of using Benfica for his own personal gain, and, 
Unfortunately for Vieira, Matamoris is a lawyer. He promised to drop his suit should Vieira resign, and when criminal, rather than civil charges, were brought upon him by the state, Vieira did finally vacate his position, initially stepping down temporarily before resigning as president for good, and Matamoris did drop his civil suit against him. The other person arrested alongside Vieira, his son, and the agent and businessman Bruno Masado is a man named Jose Antonio dos Santos, who is another wealthy Portuguese businessman with a slightly unusual nickname. Dos Santos is nicknamed Hey dos Frangos in Portugal, meaning King of Chickens, since he is a magnate within the Portuguese chicken business. Dos Santos is a major shareholder of Benfica's SAD and he is indicted on account of agreeing to sell 25% of Benfica SAD to an American businessman named John Textor for 50 million euros, whilst receiving a 1 million euro advance payment. A SAD, aside from just being what Benfica fans are about the state of their club at the moment, is also a unique type of limited company in Portugal, introduced during the early 90s to try and improve transparency at football clubs and give fans a greater degree of control over the way in which their clubs are run. Basically, at Benfica, the fans own the club. That is, the infrastructure, the branding, the licensing, and so on and so forth all funded by paid-up socios who each get to have a say on how the club is run and are able to elect Benfica's presidents, or should be, so long as those elections aren't rigged. The SAD is publicly traded, listed on the Lisbon Stock Exchange, meaning that anyone can invest in Benfica's SAD, and it owns and controls Benfica's playing and coaching staff and them alone. When people look at the value that Benfica trades at, their initial thought is often that the figure seems very low, but that is because investing in Benfica's SAD is not the same as investing in the club in its entirety. Whilst Os Santos, Macedo, and Vieira's son were all released soon after their arrests, Vieira was held in police custody for three nights, questioned for four hours, and when he was finally released, his bail was set at €3 million, Euros, the second highest figure ever issued by a Portuguese court, which should give you some idea of the magnitude of this case. Vieira inspired further distrust among Benfica fans two months before his arrest when one of Portugal's biggest banks, Novo Banco, fell into financial trouble, requiring a state bailout. When investigations began looking into what had gone wrong at the bank, it was discovered that Vieira was the bank's second biggest debtor, owing them a whopping 440 million euros, which many believe to be more than Vieira has in assets. What was even more unusual was the fact that whilst Novo Banco had chased up debtors who owed them far less than Vieira, they had seemingly never gone after the Benfica president, at least not with any degree of vigour. Perhaps coincidentally, and perhaps not, Novo Banco also made considerable loans to Benfica, among a number of other Portuguese clubs. Whilst other clubs, when it emerged that Novo Banco was in trouble, and that the clubs were also cash-strapped due to the pandemic, had made deals to settle their debts for cents on the euro, that is to say, they repaid sometimes as little as 40-50% to 50 of what they actually owed, Benfica repaid the ailing bank in full, leading some to suspect that Vieira had struck a deal with Novo Banco, agreeing to pay Benfica's debt in full, when the club could have agreed a deal for considerably less, like their rivals did, in return for them not coming after his personal debt that he owed the bank. Of course, for legal reasons, I must stress that not only is there no concrete evidence to suggest that was the case, that I know of at least, it is just an explanation that would seem to make sense, and that supporters have posited, and doing so wouldn't even necessarily be illegal so long as it was an arrangement that was simply understood by both parties, rather than being officially agreed with any kind of paper trail. The man who has replaced Vieira since the former Taya Tycoon resigned is club legend Rui Costa. One of the most talented players to don either a Portugal or a Benfica shirt, Costa was spotted by Eusebio as a five-year-old. And though he went on to spend 12 years away from Benfica with Fiorentina and AC Milan, he both started and finished his career in Lisbon, where he says his heart has always belonged, and where he is, or was, considered a club legend. Vieira's lawyer recently stated that his client hasn't given up on the possibility of returning to Benfica should his charges be dropped or a court find him innocent. But 
He is 72 years old, and very few Benfica fans would welcome that idea. In fact, despite his status as a club and national team legend during his playing days, most Benfica fans are deeply distrustful of Rui Costa as well. He was Vieira's vice president in recent years, as many dodged the role, viewing it as a poison chalice, and the idea that he had no idea what was going on at the club is currently being treated with a healthy dose of scepticism among Benfica fans. A recent poll of supporters found that 62% of fans want to see the entire Benfica board resign. Meanwhile, 88% said they wanted to see Vieira step down for good and not return to the Estadio de Luz. At the moment, Costa is only serving as Benfica's interim president ahead of the club's next presidential elections, when socios will get the opportunity to elect the candidate that they like best, hopefully in a more transparent manner than in 2020, though Costa has stated his intention to take on the job full-time. Supporters groups have been pushing for an early election in light of the chaos and the scandal that has engulfed the club, but Costa seems keen on delaying such an event for as long as possible. Costa is unpopular primarily because he is seen as an insider appointed due to his connections rather than his credentials or the usual democratic election process conducted by fans. In his first press conference as Benfica's interim president, Costa made no critique of Vieira and even spoke in fairly glowing terms about his period as president of the club, at a time in which most fans feel that he has betrayed Benfica and put his own interests ahead of the club's. There was very little transparency over what was happening at the club, something that Benfica fans are desperate to see, and something that SADs were introduced to try and facilitate. It is unsurprising that Costa didn't launch into a full-scale attack on Vieira, after all, he is his former boss who promoted him all the way to vice president, and we are talking about an ongoing criminal investigation. However, most supporters want a very clear and explicit split from the former regime, and a divergence from an era coloured by, at the very least, a perception of shadiness and corruption. They do not want continuity costa, which is a term that I just invented, as far as I'm aware, but you are welcome to it, Benfica fans. Oh yeah, sorry, that's right. You don't speak English in Lisbon, do you? Hopefully, Continua Dadja Costa translates and crosses over to Portuguese just as well, if you can actually say that word in Portuguese. Not one person has been dismissed at Benfica in light of the recent scandal, and Vieira, who is currently under house arrest, is the only person to have resigned. With alleged corruption and criminality that ran this deep, you would think it impossible that multiple people, at the very least those in the accounting department, were unaware of what was going on. Benfica fans feel as though there is a lack of accountability and that, whilst they are pleased to be rid of Vieira, the problem runs deeper than one man. Costa himself has even been accused of using his position of influence at Benfica for his own personal gain, when reports emerged that Benfica had supported his football lab business, which is described as being the first football amusement park in Dubai. Costa initially denied these claims before backtracking and conceding that Benfica had supported his business venture, but claiming that since Benfica's involvement in the project preceded him becoming vice president, he therefore couldn't be accused of abusing his position. You can see why Benfica fans are distrustful at this stage. They are sick of the idea of the club being taken for a ride, as players are sold for vast sums, only a fraction of that cash is ever reinvested in the club, and bad faith actors appear to be using the club's resources to enrich themselves, as the club itself slips behind their rivals Sporting and Porto at a time when they had the chance to really lay down a marker and begin an era of dominance within the Portuguese game had they been run well. It is important to note that Benfica's rivals may not get off scot-free either, with no official charges brought against them yet, but a murky cloud lingering over certain figures within them, particularly at Porto, along with whispers at other clubs. It emerged as part of Vieira Anco's arrest that the Portuguese authorities had been given the right, by court order, to tap Vieira's phone for the last five years, during which time he is believed to have held several conversations with other key figures in football. It is unclear, just yet, whether his arrest and the evidence that has been gathered against him could ultimately implicate other presidents, chairmen, and agents at other clubs. 
not just in Portugal, but beyond. Throughout mainland Europe, there may well be one, two, or who knows, even several individuals who are waiting with bated breath to see what emerges from the investigations into Vieira. Some of Europe's biggest clubs have long had unofficial allegations of wrongdoing lingering over them, similar to those formerly brought against Vieira. Perhaps, most notably, a couple of fairly well-known teams in La Liga. As things stand, Benfica's troubles have not yet fully spilled over onto the pitch, as I said at the beginning of this video. Jorge Jesus, who has endured a very rocky return to the club following a sensational stint in Brazil, having launched into one or two fairly vociferous defences of himself and his players in press conferences last season, began this season under immense pressure. But qualification for the Champions League group stage will have lifted a huge weight off his shoulders. Benfica fans were bitterly disappointed to miss out on a couple of signings over the summer, most notably a deal for Ruben Vinagre from Wolves on loan with a view to a permanent, who ended up signing for defending champions and near neighbours sporting instead. However, Juremchuk was a really smart signing who could score a hatful of goals this season, and Benfica now have bags of experience at the back with Jan Vertonghen and Nicolas Otamendi. This season alone isn't the primary concern though. It is the club's long-term strategy going forward. American businessman John Texter, who recently acquired a significant minority stake in Crystal Palace, appears to have had his deal to acquire 25% of Benfica's sad vetoed, though whether that deal has been torpedoed or is just on the rocks still remains to be seen. Benfica fans fear that a number of people at the club, including their current president, either turned a blind eye to Vieira's alleged corruption, actively participated in it, or are just so naive and dull-witted that they had no idea what was going on, and none of those three possibilities inspire them with confidence. So that is it for today's video. A lengthy one, but an interesting one, or I thought so at least. Hopefully you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed writing and researching it. I'm sure it was a lot less work, so there can't be too much to complain about. The adverts, I suppose. They're annoying. I'm sorry about them. I don't really have a choice. If I owned the channel, I'd maybe go down the Patreon route and scrap them all together, but that ship has probably sailed. Anyhow, I digress. Thank you all as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you did enjoy today's video. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC Sevens. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram by the username at HITC Sevens on both, should you wish to do so.